Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Rukavina. I'm from Adelphi University, and I'm here with Nancy Getchell from the University of Delaware and Allie Bryan from the University of South Carolina. And we are the co-chairs of the Shape America Special Interest Group. Um, the goal of the um, Special Interest Group is, is to introduce um, educators to the principles of motor behavior and help them apply it to their practice. Um, tonight is one of those types of sessions. And um, the title of the session is, is Motor Behavior Applications of Teaching, Aim for Success. And um, AIM is a nice little fun um, acronym for uh, assessment, inclusion, and motivation. Um, our speakers tonight um, will be Sam Logan from Oregon State University, Jericho Johnson from the University of North Texas, and Dave Stodden from the University of South Carolina. Um, um, our format tonight is every speaker will have about six minutes to introduce their topic, and then we're gonna um, go into breakout rooms. You'll get to choose which speaker you wanna um, have a conversation with. Um, so there will be about 35 minutes in breakout, and then we'll come back and have a 45 minute panel discussion where we can summarize everything we learn. Okay, um, so let's get started. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Sam and um, he will be our first uh, speaker. Okay, just getting set up here. Okay, I think we are good. Paul, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see just the slide and we're good to go? Perfect, okay. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this event. My name is Sam Logan. I use he, him pronouns, and I'll be our first presenter. I'll focus on inclusion, and Drs. Johnson and Stodden will focus on assessment and motivation, respectively. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about my data collection experience that I had during my doctoral work. And my dissertation focused on teaching a motor skill intervention to second grade students through a mastery approach where students were provided choices to engage with PE lessons. And Dr. Johnson will talk a bit more about this mastery approach, but something I'll never forget about this experience is in the class before I taught, there was a student who used a standing device and was not mobile on his own. He was always excluded from PE, and this always just stuck with me. Um, I'll also say that I don't think that this exclusion was specifically due to the PE teacher. Uh, rather, I think it was really about the numerous systematic and institutional barriers and ableist attitudes throughout public education and broader society that resulted in that exclusion. Um, fast forward to my postdoc research experience where I became involved with power mobility use of young children with disabilities. Power mobility is use of a motorized wheelchair, which is pictured on the left, or other similar device, such as the Explorer Mini, which is pictured in the center, the yellow and blue device, uh, or a modified riding car, pictured on the right. So for the last 10 years, I've been involved with the Go Baby Go program that modifies off-the-shelf ride-on toy cars through installation of a large, easy-to-press activation switch and custom seating support using low-cost materials such as Velcro and PVC pipe. Typically, these cars come with a foot pedal for activation and can be difficult for children with disabilities to use, and modifications result in greater accessibility for, for these kiddos. I'll go ahead and play a video of a kiddo with medically complex needs using a ride-on car. Uh, they were dependent on technology for survival. I'll just go ahead and play the video. Um, it's silent, so I'll just keep talking a bit over it here. We'll see if it catches up. Um, I did hit play, so we'll see. We'll see if it comes. Um, but this kiddo was the one who changed my view about physical activity. And, you know, kinesiology places a really high emphasis on moderate to vigorous physical activity because of its association with positive health outcomes. But this kiddo made me become much more interested in how physical activity or movement in general is used to explore the environment and interact with others. She may not be able to engage in MVPA, but she can move, and especially in a ride-on car. Uh, this video just showed her driving, um, driving this car up and down these hallways of this 24-7 uh, care facility where she lived at the time. 
Our research team recently published a perspective about mobility equity called on-time mobility. And the main take-home message is that mobility is a fundamental human right. This is a position that is supported by the United Nations through their two documents titled The Rights of Persons with Disabilities, 2006, and The Rights of Children, 1990. So for example, the 2006 document mandates that all human rights and fundamental freedoms on an equal basis with other children in Article 7, with services as early as possible and access to mobility aids that facilitate personal mobility in Article 20. So the core idea of on-time mobility is that young children with disabilities should be provided with mobility experiences at the same time as their typically developing peers. For example, infants crawl and walk in the first year of life, and children with disabilities deserve equitable mobility experiences at the same time. Our concept is also called on-time mobility because for a long time, providing power mobility in the form of these devices to children under age of five was called early power mobility. And we felt this was a misnomer because after the first year of life, we are in fact late to provide mobility. One-time mobility has five principles, including timing, urgency, multimodal, frequency, and sociability. Timing is about the importance of providing equitable mobility experience for children with disabilities at a time when their peers are mobile. Urgency acknowledges the importance of timing to drive children's development in the first year of life. Multimodal embraces that mobility can take many forms from typical physical development to the use of mobility technology, such as gait trainers, forearm crutches, powered or manual wheelchairs, or any other means that is functional for a child. Frequency highlights that children engage in high dosage of mobility in real world environments. And finally, sociability recognizes the dynamic interaction between mobility and social interactions. We move to engage with others and we engage with others when we move. This is especially important and relevant for the physical education context. So the discussion question that we can at least start with in a breakout room will be, how can on-time mobility be applied to physical education settings? Okay, so that concludes my, my six minutes. I will stop my share and Dr. Johnson will be up next. Thank you, Sam. Can somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see? All right, so I am the M and AIM, I am the motivation aspect. And so just a little bit of background about me. Again, I'm Dr. Johnson and um, I've graduated Morehouse College as well as doing my graduate studies at the University of Auburn or Auburn University. And then I'm currently a second year assistant professor at the University of North Texas. So my research focuses on the development of childhood health behaviors kind of exploring the underlying mechanisms. And so one specific area within my work is mastery of motivational climate interventions. And so for some of you that may or may not be familiar, these are child-centered autonomous approaches. And so that's kind of the lens that I'll be talking about or sharing from today. And so I look at these interventions from both a pedagogical and a, a developmental perspective. And I also know that many of you may not run these type of climates, but I still believe that there are some parallels and still some comparisons that we can make together with, with what I'll be discussing today. But moreover, one of the biggest problems that I've seen based on my experience working with pre-service teachers is this idea of content design. And so our students really excel at delivering lesson plans, but they struggle mightily with the creation of developing appropriate activities. And so one question that I wanna lay on your minds as I go through this next five minutes is, what are some of the most important factors that we need to consider or should be considering when designing tasks in movement settings for young children? And so we looked at these mastery autonomous climates um, interventions, and we looked at the children's behaviors during these interventions. So we started to analyze what are the children doing with this autonomy? And so we came up with two terms that we described as attraction and holding power that I'll describe today in relation to designing motivating uh, activities within movement settings. And so please keep in mind that I'm coming from the preschool age. Um, this, is, this study was affiliated with preschool age children. And so the first concept is this idea of attraction power, or we looked at what stations did the children go to most often or 
And so we looked at their behavior and we de deductively analyzed the stations that they went to most often and identified some key characteristics about those stations. And so three things emerged as far as attraction power. And the first was novelty. And so young children, and even some of us as adults, we love novelty. And so we found that the children really gravitated towards the newly identified stations within those lessons or across the intervention. They love the opportunity to practice new skills. And so from a pedagogical perspective, this presents a challenge to me and many of others as we tend to recycle activities within our movement settings, especially for those of you who may be more seasoned, who already have things that work really well. And so the question that I ask myself is how often do I switch up the activities that I think are already really good in terms of novelty? The second thing was authenticity. And so our, or things that appear genuine to the young children, out, even outside of the intervention. And so this is critical for us to be mindful of working with children from lower income households because can they relate to what they're doing here in our movement settings and also have access to practice, practice these things outside at home. But overall, we found that they were least attracted to activities that may not have appeared more authentic. And so you see here, the young child here and Jalen dribbling playground basketballs. Well, dribbling was one of our least attractive stations in the beginning because we were using playground balls which was a little bit easier to learn the concept of dribbling for three and four year olds. But it wasn't very authentic to them because playground balls didn't really equate to, to dribbling. And so we found that when we changed and used actual basketballs, they were a little bit more interested in the, or attracted to this station because of the authenticity, but they still weren't very good dribblers. And then the final thing that would at least attract the kids to the station was this idea of perceived difficulty. And so we found that the children were much less eager to practice skills that they could not do well or even or that they didn't perceive themselves as doing well, which was also uh, the dribbling in the case for us. So I just want to give you an example of one of our most attractive stations that we had within this particular study. Striking of the balloon. So this idea of working on hand eye coordination through striking. Um, we were able to keep it novel throughout the sessions by um, adding layers to the, the same activity station across the intervention. So maybe when we first introduced it, it was just without paddles, so just using hands and balloons. And then we would eventually introduce lollipop paddles and other type of paddles. We could change the color of the balloon, so on and so forth. So we were able to keep this station novel. Playing with the balloon was also fun and authentic to many of our children, even outside of this particular setting, which made it attractive. And then many of the children knew that they could at least perform the, uh, the activity to some degree. So there was varying levels of abilities within the, how we design the striking station. And I'll talk about that here on the next slide. So not only did we look at, you know, what, where did they spend most, uh, where did they go to? We looked at where did they spend most of their time at, or this idea of holding power. And so we, again, analyzed the stations that they stayed at the longest and we came up with three things for this concept as well. And so the first one is this idea of being built for success or the activities that had the best holding powers were built for success. So these were th things that had a good match between the children's current ability that dynamically changed across the intervention and the demands of the task, or what we generally call developmentally appropriate. But the key concept here in relation to even what Sam was talking about with inclusion is how can we develop an activity that can all children can be successful, no matter their ability levels, and keep them all engaged um, for longer periods of time, which can be challenging for us. The second theme was the potential for modification. And so we noticed that um, they really stayed at the stations that have multiple different action possibilities, right? And so we bring this code up. If you can do it, and it may inspire you, but all you can do is the same thing over and over, you may not stay motivated for a longer period of time. And so that's why I chose to show this um, Minda here rolling, doing the rolling station. And the rolling, you can roll forward, you can roll backwards, you can roll sideways. There were many different modifications that they can make within this one particular station. And then the final thing that was related to how long they stayed at the station was the frequency of progress point outs, or the extent to which the settings or the station gives the kid, gave the kid clear and numerous indication of progress without the verbal feedback of teachers. This is big from a practical perspective because there's many more children 
in our settings than we have related to inst instructors or teachers. And so how can we build in these frequency of progress point outs within the stations where they can know that they're improving or doing better without the need for us to tell them such a thing? And so and one of our most, one of our best stations for holding power, they stayed at the longest, was this idea of jumping, right? So jumping was um, built for success in that um, many individuals of, of different ability levels could do the task to some degree, right? No matter if you were could jump high or jump far, you could do the task to some degree. A lot of variety of options, as you can see here, you can do a one foot jump, a two foot jump. We, we started out with one mat, we went up to two, up to three. Um, we will use the pool noodles. They could jump up and try to touch the pool noodle. I can extend how far out they tried to reach for the pool noodle or closer. Um, we can we use colored mats to see if they can hit the blue or hit the yellow, right? How can we include a variety of tasks within one station? And then progress point outs. They could, each time that they jump, they we're getting direct feedback without me having to say anything about their, their progress or their progression. And so thinking of this idea of holding power and attraction power, for those of you that may want to join the breakout room, we talk about motivation and engagement within activity design. Some questions that we that I would like to discuss are what problems do you have as practitioners and researchers designing activities? About how much time do you spend designing activities within your movement settings? And how has that changed when you first started? If you are more seasoned, and if that was the same when you first started. And then what advice would you give pre-service and novice teachers on designing really good activities within their movement settings? And then just simply asking, asking other practitioners and educators or pre-service teachers, do your students struggle with activity design in the, in the same manner? So that concludes my six minutes. If I may have gone over a little bit on the idea of motivating tasks within movement settings. All right, I'll, I'll take it from there. Uh, thank you, Jericho. Thank you, Sam. And thank you everyone for being on on a Friday afternoon. Greatly appreciate it. My name is Dave Stodden. I'm the director of the Human Performance and Development Lab at University of South Carolina. And I'm going to be talking about assessment. So, so working with both Sam and Jericho's presentations, we talked a little bit about, well, how do we assess the mobility? How do we assess uh, how successful interventions are? And understanding that assessment can be a dirty word in physical education. Uh, I want to put that out there just right away. Um, is there a way that we can look at this and, and kind of reformulate what we think about assessment? And this all started about five, six years ago. Darla Castelli and I had a, a chat at the Shape America conference. And we're talking about a, a national assessment for standard one. So looking at the motor skill assessment idea. And, and this conversation turned into a conversation that was related to 50 million strong, which was happening at that point in time. Conversation led to additional conversations with Judy Rink, Jackie Lund, Hans von der Mars. And this next turned into a meeting at Reston, Virginia to develop a national assessment for standard one. Uh, so Shape America gave us our marching orders and we completed this idea, um, primarily written by Judy Rink, Jackie Lund, with Darla. And the idea was to be able to assess as we would normally potentially at second grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, and somewhere in high school, including standard one motor skill assessments, as well as the fitness idea. So that turned into a 270, 17 page document. So from that aspect, along the way, looking at this idea of assessment and why we don't assess as physical education teachers, why we don't promote assessment uh, enough in my estimation, in, in terms of developing our pre-service teachers. So again, along the way, thinking about assessment and trying to transition our thought processes to feasibility. Feasibility assessment in terms of uh, locomotor and object projection manipulation tasks, as well as functional coordination. Some foundational aspects that we could assess, that we all could assess, that would tr translate to development across time. So that's what we've been looking at. So in the in the the after the after session here, and we go to our breakouts, I want to be able to chat with you a little bit about your thoughts about assessment, um, why we haven't been doing it, and what would actually promote us being able to assess to a great degree in physical education, not only in our our particular 
educational constructs, but in schools. So um, in building these assessments that we talked about, that we're going to talk about a little bit more in the breakout session, um, working with a group of nine faculty now. So this, this group bridged out to go, well, let's, let's see if we can make this more feasible. So nine faculty uh, turned into 11 uh, across the nation in Hawaii, New Mexico, Idaho, Texas, Louisiana, Michigan, Illinois, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina. So we've got a good represented representation here of faculty in, in the different aspects of the US. And what we've come up with was this idea of ABCs for PE. So assessment behaviors and cognition for PE, for equals assessment domain, domains of not only motor, but also motivation. So the psychological aspect of it, self-concept motivations, uh, social emotional development uh, and cognition. So we're looking at these four domains that we can actually look at and think about this, if we can feasibly do some assessment um, in schools, is that possible? So to limit the, limit the amount of training that's necessary, number one, limit the amount of equipment that we need to assess and be able to have feasible assessments that we can also tap into technology to go to that next level that's interest of motivation for students that would be outstanding. Can we do that? So I just want you to be thinking about that as, as you figure out where to move in terms of the breakout sessions. Again, hop between one and the other. I hope you can do that so we can all uh, participate in the different breakout sessions. So again, think about assessment in terms of what we want to do. And I'll go to that next that, that next round when we go into breakout sessions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Um, and thank you all the speakers. Um, now it's time to do our breakout rooms. And so we will all have um, 25 minutes or 35 minutes to um, discuss these particular topics. Um, our, our facilitator, um, Audra from Shape America is going to provide you a choice and then choose and get into the one of the three different rooms from each one of the different speakers. We have the... Uh, Okay. What we're going to do is Allie, me, and um, um, Nancy are going to do a two-minute summary of the different rooms, and then um, Allie will facilitate the, um, the panel discussion um, thing. So, Allie? Yes, so we had a nice group uh, of folks ranging from Belgium to, I think, formerly from Texas, but seating, sitting in Connecticut all over the place, um, having a nice robust discussion about assessment. And, and Dave basically summarized what he and his team are doing to try to create a developmental and translational slash ecological assessment uh, using mostly a product oriented approach with, with three different actual um, assessment items. So the standing long jump, supine to stand and go and throwing and catching uh, off a wall. And, you know, the long story short is if we can do these assessments, these exact same ones starting in kindergarten and going up to, you know, 12th grade, then we can best capture how our students are changing across developmental time and, and in a ecological way. So low cost, low training, feasible, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope I captured that for you, Dave, and then we will bring out some talk on that in our panel. And I'll, I'll jump in with our, our group with Jericho. Um, we had a, a very a good discussion, very wide ranging. In fact, we were in the thick of it, and then all of a sudden we were bumped back. So um, we talked about a, a sort of a wide range of topics related to motivation, um, but we wanted to focus down on um, one point: How can we help pre-service teachers design good activities? And um, some of the comments were, were related to feedback, providing uh, feedback for what they're doing. Um, the, so sometimes it's hard for pre-service uh, students to let their guard down. So giving them opportunities to, um, to sh just break free and not think about people watching them and what they do. Um, the, another great idea was record and reflect. So when the pre-service teacher 
is teaching, have them record or, or not have them record, record what they're doing and then have them reflect on what's happening around them because they might not see it and might not think about it. Um, and then completing the circle by having them use that reflection to guide their future um, activities that they design. Um, think through culturally appropriate activities um, that, that will resonate with the, the students that they're teaching. Um, suggest that they move away from specific skills and move towards different tasks. So instead of emphasizing throwing, emphasizing some sort of a task where you throw. So if, for example, girls don't want to throw, then uh, because it, it's not culturally appropriate, you can uh, fake them out and, ha and ha the students can design activities that allow them to throw without focusing on, on throwing itself. Um, and let's see. Uh, I didn't finish writing this, the rest of the sentence, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Um, and then um, I was in Sam's um, session and um, we talked about um, mobility as a human right. And I, I, I thought, uh, you know, when I hear that, I'm like, yes. But I, when I heard that initially, I really didn't know what it meant. And by providing these uh, mobile devices for these children, um, it provides them access to development. And it's by being able to move around, you can increase your perceptual motor, you can increase your cognitive, but your social and it provides that autonomy. So I'm like, yes, it's good for people to move, but it just provides access to all this development that you don't think about. And um, Sam has some like amazing programs. He talked about the mobile car devices, but then he went in and talked about the, the, the cars can like pitch things in a throwing manner. So it's the program of throw baby throw. And that, that, was, that blew my mind. And then he went into talking about dance baby dance. There's these apparatuses that hang from the ceiling that allow kids to dance. And, and, and so I'm like, wow, but now that you have these, um, you know, mobile devices that allow them to move, and then you can think about what, what Jericho was talking about and is, is how we can dev devise these tasks. And um, Sam talked about how some parents were de designing obstacle courses and, and, and then we think about what's the right amount of movement and dose and the right amount of social interaction and you having people, you know, mobile, like regularly able bodies, and then how they interact with the cars, uh, and then you how you have um, car kids on with cars and kids without or with cars and how they all interact. And I think the thing that hit me the most was, but once you provide these environments for them and they're moving, there's these cascading effects and you find out all these abilities you didn't know that your children had and that's where really the uh, the assessment comes in is like you're you're seeing the development and you're able to assess the development and their progress and you know if they learn get to a, their functioning and so I was just I was like wow this is this is I never really thought about it this way and so um that's that's kind of what um a lot of the thing and then Eddie in our session was talking about how you can do it for older kids not just the birth to three and so he he's thinking a, a lot about that uh, kind of thing okay well uh, sounds like you had some good interactions in all the sessions so let's have these cascading effects occur now into our full session so um <laughs> We have uh, a nice opportunity now for the audience to ask questions to our, our three speakers. So I wanna start with that and then I will probe if need be. So and any questions for any of our speakers from the audience? You could pop them in the chat and I'll read them. You can unmute, 
and you know, pedagogically, we know any questions never really works, but I'm going to give it a shot. If I could jump in and ask someone, I'd like to get some people's feedback that we're on our uh, breakout session. Is that possible? If you'd like. Pushing the envelope here. Angela, what do you think? How does that look from an assessment perspective in the state of Arizona? It sounds lovely, <laughs> but uh, knowing how um, physical education is viewed in Arizona, where there is no mandate at all, uh, suggested only suggested requirements. Um, I would love to do these types of assessments. I think it's needed, uh, but I still think we have a long way to go before they're even accepted. Um, but that's Arizona. I am originally from New York, where things move a little faster. So uh, <laughs> I can see it working there before here. Can I add that a little bit? Go, Candace. I was going to uh, pick on the next anyway. Okay, good. We'll see. <laughs> Speed you to it. So I'm from Oregon and it's also not, also not mandated there. So it's not such a dirty, fitness gram is not such a dirty word there. It's pretty much the only assessment anybody would ever use. Um, not much more was, it was, you know, again, it's that feasibility thing. It took two days to get through all of it. And then teachers were just exhausted. So what you said to be able to combine them and be able to, again, less equipment, less time to be able to look at multiple things at what, one time, I think would make a huge difference within the actual classroom to get more people to do it. So um, I get that, you know, in other places where you're forced to do some sort of assessment, that can be um, a little bit, little bit more intimidating. But I, I like what you're saying. I like anything that you can make it easier and quicker to do and be able to get to all the students, I think is super helpful. So I liked what you were saying. Thank you. And not saying we, we still have that Shape America document. There's still PE metrics out there. No, that was one comment. They're still there. We'd love people to use them. Love people to use them in formative assessments in terms of how they assess at the end of every um, developmental uh, unit that they teach, but it's just not happening. And that's why we're talking about trying to think about ways to make this easier, more feasible, with less training involved and less time that takes away from physical education instruction. Dave, what was your three? You say it was three, three uh, main skills, long jump? Well, so we've got a, three assessments that capture the long jump, which is, you know, that that's actually a combined assessment, get, which gets into musculoskeletal fitness as well as the lo locomotor aspect. And actually, to me, it's an agility test moving from point A to point B right away. We've got a throw and catch assessment. So we've got throwing and catchment built into one. And then we've got a supine to stand and go global functional coordination that actually involves that, again, global functional capability. And then you've got an acceleration speed and agility piece of the puzzle that happens because you get up from supine, laying on your back, get up as fast as you can, run around the cone 10 meters, 30 feet, and sprint back. So we've got multiple skills and assessments and ones that translate into functional capability in essence, mm -hmm. health-related fitness aspects as well. And that gives us a foundation to really understand where kids are from multiple skill perspective. Dave, can I ask a, a follow-up? Um, where are you uh, in the, the validation process? Yep. So currently we've, we've got a couple of dissertations that are looking at these uh, tests, but because, I mean, you're talking about supine to stand and you're talking about a 10 meter sprint and going back and forth. Those have been validated for quite some time in multiple directions. And again, the tests that we're trying to promote here are attempting to, uh, we're, we're attempting to be able to test these, assess these in anywhere from kindergarten all the way through 18. So it's a developmental assessment that we can track across time. Brian's got some good data for his dissertation on throw and catch where we have a linear increase across time. So where we are in validation, we know that throwing and catching, well, we've got good tests there. And realistically, we, we know what throwing looks like across time. And these tests are translating to developmental sequences or what the process looks like, as well as relating to a product, a product of maximal speed. Um, standing long jump, again, it's been out there forever. We just wanna be able to use these three. So in terms of validating the actual assessment protocols, well, we know they're grounded in all the assessment work that we've been doing since 1960s and before. So great question. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to uh, Sam and Jericho. So 
Sam and Jericho is for both of you. And uh, we'll have Jericho go first and then Sam, if that's cool. So what, what are your long-term goals for your research? And what would you need to change in order to accomplish these goals? Wow, that's a, that's a big one. Um, so our interventions work. I mean, mastery climbers work for skill development and other health-related outcomes for preschool age children specifically, right? Um, long term, we need somebody to implement other than than researchers. And so my first things first is better. Initially, I would say training pre-service teachers so that they have the skills to implement it if they when they go, so choose to go into the setting. But really it's early childhood educators. And I think the long-term goal is to train them, but I don't know about your programs. Our early childhood educators don't have to have any motor development classes. Early childhood education is a separate major. None of them have a motor background. And so I think first things first is, you know, being an advocate of how, you know, how important it is for early childhood educators to be trained in some kind of basic level motor, de motor development, motor behavior class um, within their curriculum. And I've seen a couple of head nods. It sounds like early childhood is separate, a separate entity. So I think a better collaboration between kinesiology and early childhood education on campus is, is like the first, first place. Um, early childhood education is like this hot major that everybody wants to get into. And then, so I think, I think a better collaboration with them would be the first, uh, first and foremost for me. And I think if we can do that, then that is a better approach to training teachers in movement and intervention and activities and assessments. Um, and I think the collaboration will help for me particularly because we think about our PE pre-service teachers. I think uh, we talked about um, for preschool kids, this idea of imaginative play, right? And so we talked about how most of our educators come from sports backgrounds and they want to be coaches. And so they approach it from a athletic standpoint or coach standpoint and not a movement for all standpoint or movement for the sake of development and for health. And so I think this collaboration with early childhood educators is going to be essential because they look at it a little bit differently. And so now we can bring the pieces of the puzzle together. They bring some of the imaginative play, the imaginative ideas for design, the PE brings some of the movement things, and now we merge together to become more effective for serving, uh, for serving young kids in intervention. And so I think that's kind of where my mind, my mind is going. I don't know who the hell I think I am to have power to, to tell early childhood educators that they need to add, change their curriculum and add a course but I mean, essentially, it, I think that 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 would be um, most ideal long term, or or and hopefully short term for me. So Jericho, that's interesting. Let me just follow up to that, Sam, and then I'll I'll move up to you. Um, we used to. It used okay. to be, particularly when I was at Ohio State beforehand, and and even at South Carolina, it used to be that all early childhood education majors would take a motor development course or some sort of child development slash option and actually they, they have the choice to take a course with us or an art or a, a music, right? A choice, because you know, they're not all important. But okay, understanding that they used to do it and now they no longer do, how do we get them back? Okay. What do you think? What's your thoughts? How do I go get them? I think in the, in the world of, um, highly accredited degree plans in the universities unless it, and I don't I'm not familiar with the early childhood standards for academic programs but I would hope that it has a motor development component somewhere but I think that in institutions that are that have accredited programs unless it's in their standards it will be very difficult to get someone to add a course many of our degree plans have so many required um, hours that students really don't even have the option of taking very many elective courses like they used to because it is very logical that if you were working with young children that a motor development course and and if you are working with an elderly population we teach motor development from an across the lifespan perspective and not just about children mm -hmm. um, but I think in the universities unless it's tied to a standard and somebody decides that they're going to address that by using a kinesiology course instead of their own child development course, that's going to be a difficult sell for a lot of programs. Yes. And I think, Ali, what came to mind, thank you, Nancy, is 
the connection to like what we, like we've been trying to do, the cognitive connection. I think, you know, from connecting movement to academic, some kind of academic outcome, like executive function or cognitive uh, function, those kind of things. I think that's our um, primarily our only hope for making that connection. And so that I guess early childhood educators can see how their promotion of movement it's also going to be beneficial in the classroom setting or, in, you know, for the children beyond just moving for the sake of. I have one. As if, as if movement isn't healthy, movement isn't good health enough, right? I have one quick follow-up, which which might actually bridge the gap here to Sam, because talking about like that collaboration between somebody who's working in the community, like a teacher or um, maybe somebody who's working in a like, a therapy center for children with special needs. I've, in my experience, it can those those relationships can be it can be really hard to build trust because they have their skill that they're doing and they're invested in. And so to say to come in and say, well, you should do movement because it'll help with everything else. I've found that it's hard to establish trust. And then I've always wondered if actually doing the intervention with the adults who work in these settings wouldn't be something that's like how like we do this with kids and we think that they'll experience these changes and they'll be more motivated to go on and be you know live healthier and happier and be more active and experience the benefits i've always wondered if that would if actually working with our adult populations who we want to implement these things if actually doing an intervention at their level and then saying, hey, do you think this would work with the children that you work with too? Because now you're experiencing the benefits. Or hopefully, hopefully. Interesting. Well, thank you for that nice segue. I appreciate it. So now we'll transition to Sam. So Sam, what are, what are your long-term goals and what do you need to have change in order to achieve them? Yeah, thanks. I think those are all great thoughts from everyone. Um, yeah, I think this is less of a research goal, more of the you know the practical goal. The picture I had on my slide in the middle, that's the uh, the Explorer Mini, and that is uh, well, was just commercially released in spring of 2020 for 12 to 36 month olds. And prior to that release of that device, that's kind of why the modified ride-on cards existed because there just wasn't anything commercially available for children three and under. So I think now the goal is now that that device is actually available, it still costs, I believe, twenty six, twenty eight hundred dollars, um, which is much less than the thirty thousand typically for a pediatric power chair for a five year old, three to five year olds. But you know that it was just standard practice that children with mobility disabilities were funded through insurance on the first try, not the tenth or eleventh try, a device when they are eligible for it immediately. And that that would bridge the gap to other devices and not just that you know families and kids get access to the devices but kind of what jericho was talking about as well is that from you know the physical therapy occupational therapy early intervention physical educators uh, early education teachers that there's a whole systematic buy-in to providing opportunities for children to use these and any other related devices, whether it's communication or other mobility devices, whatever it might be, as a part of daily practice. And we we also still um, come up against, you know, the perceptions that are out there. I think David mentioned in the chat that, you know, most people think that, um, you know, motor skills develop naturally over time. And, you know, we kind of have that similar kind of preconception we're always fighting against of, well, if you provide augmented mobility in a different way, that that's going to delay or inhibit or cause children not to walk in some way, shape, or form. And there's been no evidence of that yet. There's been two RCTs, one, one that we were a part of, and in fact, we, we found greater motor changes for the power mobility groups. Um, so I think um, what needs to change is you know, systematic changes from sort of starting funding any of these devices all the way to clinical and education practices. Thanks, Sam. So um, I'm hearing a common theme. Uh, oh. Sorry, Ellie. I don't know. Sorry, I just have one more thing to say. Um, I mentioned the collaboration between the, the the programs and then the family. And I think I didn't think to say that because we, we had a whole bunch of discussion on parents at home. I think serving the whole child is, is just kind of what makes sense. We need to serve the entire child. And, and sometimes, I mean, that includes home, school, 
and elsewhere. And so I think, I know you doing some of the parent, some of the work, including parents and interventions, but just the same thing that Stephanie Palmer said, including um, these families or the parents, the home aspect, we have to consider that going forward for full effectiveness. So I missed that part. I just said the, the educator child part, but the parent too, is the bridge, the bridge the gap from home to school. So I couldn't agree with you more. Jericho, of course, you know that. But um, so I'm hearing a, a common theme across all three presenters is that changing this notion of valuation, valuation for what it is that you do and changing expectations. And then I'm just wondering if somehow we could get this all together where we're, we're assessing consistently, we're assessing all children, right? And, and it's letting people know, be aware, right? Of what's happening so that they are more likely to want to implement programs like Jericho's and use devices like Sam's to make sure that all children have that mobility right. It's interesting. So question for all here is, is all right, so in order to make these things happen, we have to change policy and then change accountability structures for the policies. You can have the policy, but if nobody holds you accountable to it, the policy is kindling, mm -hmm. right? So what's the best united way to do that? How do we do it? How do we change it? How do we change policy and, and, and enact accountability structures? So if Dave wants assessments done, and I agree with him, they're not, and we know PE teachers, right? They have such limited time. And when I was in Ohio, it was, you know, 30 minutes every three days. How do we convince them to, to take that time to do what Dave's pitching? And, and so to me, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's valuation, valuing these things and changing expectations. So how do we do that and get those that information and these data into these policymakers' hands. Any thoughts on this? Go, Dave. So if I could start, um, got to have a grassroots campaign here. We originally were talking about getting fellows involved in Shape America Research Consortium to be able to push the envelope. We've got to be able to bridge more, get bo more boots on the ground, connecting researchers with schools. So I know everyone gets out into schools, but it's mainly for the pre-service teachers, but can we actually implement this idea of assessment and then translate that? And another part of the equation, um, you know, I, I'm never afraid to bring something out here, but we've got a lot of roll out the ballers, a lot of coaches that don't care about physical education, specifically at the secondary level. So how do we translate or get them interested in actually doing something, uh, promoting quality physical education? Well, what if we could actually, and this gets back to, um, you know, Bob, I think you had this comment about not selling the fitness gram, but dare we say that, and I know this is the case, we translate our assessments into, you know what, coaches, this is actually uh, functional capability, long-term athletic development ideas. You want to build your program developmentally, you build it from the ground up. You don't just get what you get at, you know, freshmen and develop your athletes. So because I know I've, I've done these type of assessments with athletes at the highest level and it translates. So just another idea about how to sell this idea to different people, because it's not a one size fits all. And that's interesting, Dave, because I'm thinking about, you mentioned K, K all the way through, right? And so you have this data available for these cultures or for these individuals that's interested, that's tracking longitudinally um, skill development or, or the, this development. I think that they will probably buy into that too. I mean, even beyond high school, like on recruiting level, I mean, you can, see patterns and see see changes. I think having access to that data for some people would be interesting, maybe that maybe for some buy-in. Because while we do have our physical education champions out there in schools, they're limited in number. So mm -hmm. be realistic. We've got to get more out there. But so how do we sell this argument? How do we get these get this information to people's hands so that they see the value in it? And that taps into again the other aspects of the equation, the affective, psychological, motivational perceptions, self-efficacy. Um, social personal responsibility. And we have that, we have that capability also in a feasible manner where we don't have to take up educational instructional time, physical education instructional time. Because we have them on technology, we have them on Qualtrics. They can take them outside of PE. I'm well, thinking... how are we doing on time? Just want to check in. I know Nancy's got oh, yeah, some info. Like, I guess we have one minute. Um, but I have uh, Dave mentioned something um, really interesting about 
what happens if we had one great idea and then we got all the Shape America fellows from all their different universities to implement and reach out on that one great idea? That, that's an amazing idea. I mean, it's doable. I mean, Tan Len Go will be the, um, the new um, research council. Um, approach her and say, let's do this. We have nine so far. Okay, so for the sake of time, Nancy, I am going to throw the ball off the wall for you to catch it. Okay, all right. So I we, I just wanted to thank everyone from uh, but Ali, Ali, Paul, and I would like to thank you for attending. This I think this is really successful. Um, we hope to see you at Shape. I just put in the chat box our motor behavior SIG presentations. Um, what you should know is that we're trying to focus on translation. So in in our group, Nancy mentioned that sometimes students, pre-service te teachers compartmentalize. What we're trying to do with the motor behavior SIG is provide ideas to help get those very useful ideas from motor behavior, motor development, motor learning into the hands of teachers, give them ideas for activities and, um, and help to them to use these in, in a real world, or at least think about them in a real world sense in a in a, a PE classroom sense. So we have lots of good stuff. We have um Allie Bryan is all over the place. She's gonna be she's never gonna sleep, but she's uh doing first starting us off with a, a motor behavior um help me learn my motor skills, children with vis visual impairments. That sounds interesting. Then we're gonna have a, a coffee talk right after that, that's Wednesday the 29th, where uh, Allie and I are gonna talk about creating evidence-based pedagogy practices. So this is where the rubber meets the road. This is exactly what you're talking about. So what we want our SIG to be is something useful to uh, PEAT people. So that's, we'll, we'll be talking about uh, translation there. We have our seed and top lecture. We have using motor behavior research to enhance meaning. Uh, on Wednesday. So we have lots of stuff in this in this vein. Uh, a lot more stuff throughout the conference. It's so much you can look in the chat book box. But we hope to see you there. And when we do see you there, stop and say hi. So thanks again. And thanks very much to our speakers. You did an excellent job. So let's give them a round of applause. All right. <laughs> Quick question. If anybody has email information or wants email information to further communicate, great. Please feel free to contact. Yeah, is there like a pause there, like a somewhere we can put our emails? You could put it in the chat box. Yeah. We I thought that you guys kept the list of everybody that there, oh, there, there is a list and we could send it out to everybody. Yep. I believe everyone that signed up is added to it. 